what is Christian assurance. Uh, this is my story, this is my song. I wonder what is your story and your song, uh, if you have that. So if you have a story about your coming <coughs> to faith and the song that it's put into in, your heart, what does it mean to be assured, be completely confident that you are a believer? Outward appearance is not always, is it? Inward reality. Sure, aware of that from our experiences. We talked last week, or Steve was here speaking about what is necessary, what is essential for salvation. Uh, and of course, last week we were looking at this subject of penal substitution. Uh, that is, uh, if you take away the jargon, uh, how can we be sure that, that we are saved? Well, because Christ died on the cross as a punishment, word penal, a punishment. Yes, God's wrath, God's just anger. For sin was visited on Christ in our place. We need to hear that sort of gospel, that true gospel, because there are many inadequate gospels that are preached. You may have heard something on the lines, for instance, that the cross is an example, a supreme example of sacrificial love. You think, yes, of course it was. And it certainly was that, but by itself, that is inadequate and it will not save you. You may desire to follow that example. Uh, to do likewise, say, that inspires me greatly to, to follow him, but that is not going to save you. So the first thing we need to say is, from last week, we need to be sure we have heard the true gospel. Because there are many false or inadequate gospels. They're not always false, they're often inadequate. It means they fall short of what you need to know. But secondly, of course, you need to have genuine faith. To put your faith in what you've heard, to follow that. But how would you know whether your faith is genuine or not? Lots of people have faith. Lots of people in churches have faith. This is a, I'm going to read a letter which some of you may have uh, read before. Uh, it came, it was printed two years ago in Evangelicals Now, the newspaper that some of us uh, take. It's very moving. Written by someone uh, who is anonymous. He says this, when I was in my early 20s, I was brought under the sound of the gospel by a Christian friend and, quote, prayed the prayer of acceptance and commitment to Christ. When nothing much happened, I was told to trust faith and not my own feelings. When I understood the gospel better, I realised that this had been a false conversion because I was continuing in sin and had no personal knowledge of Christ let alone a heartfelt love for him. I must therefore have acted emotionally, partly to please my friend, and without understanding the nature of, or counting the cost of, true discipleship. As I grew older and increased in knowledge of the faith, I believed all that the scriptures taught, and read little but Christian literature. However, my besetting sins mainly selfishness, pride and lust, show that I have led an increasingly double life. See, there's an outward appearance, but there's not the inward reality. <laughs> Outwardly, seen as a strong believer, I took up leadership positions in the church, he says, and I'm sure it would be an evangelical church, but secretly still treading the broad path of disobedience in the world while Satan dulled my senses to the truth. Looking back, I realised that the Lord was still reaching out to me. In the workplace, various positions were removed and promotions denied to me. In contrast, several situations threatening exposure, danger or even death were miraculously, I now believe, diffused. Again, I'm slow to recognise the significance of these interventions. From time to time, I made efforts to repent and reform. And in my 70s, I spent half a day in attempted recommitment. But the joy of true belief has not come to me, nor the love of Christ, which is the mark of all the true children of God. Temptations have begun to fade now that I am old and close to death. But though I often approach the Lord carefully with tears, I realise that his patience is exhausted 
And that's as with Esau, I have made shipwreck with my soul. I'm writing this letter because it is the only positive move spiritually that I can still make. And to warn others against refusing to obey God and to remind them that without holiness, no one will ever see him. Yours sincerely, Anon. How do you react to that? If you want to think more about it this evening, we're going to meet at uh, the Church on the Green at 6.30 and uh, we can talk about these sort of things and, uh, and what we were listening to there, what was going on in that person's life. But certainly I'm sure all of us, as we listened to that, uh, we'd have felt moved. We'd have felt desperately sad. Uh, here he is in his 20s at the beginning of the letter, in his 70s at the end, 50 years have gone by so quickly. And yet... Uh, in the 70s, he's feeling like, what a waste. It sounds it, so hopeless as well. It sounds as if he feels that he's never going to make it. And yet we know, and he knows as well, that his eternal destiny is what's at stake here. He's talking about where he will be forever when he goes to the grave. What will be his destiny? What can be bigger than that? Particularly when you get to 70 or beyond 70. What can be more important? As, uh, as the reality of death comes up and begins to uh, confront him. I want us to recognise that his case also is, uh, is not unique. In, in this sense that there are many cases even in scripture, as well as perhaps you might have met them yourselves, people in that situation. But in scripture itself, many people we are shown who have the outward appearance of faith. As this man did, elected to, well, appointed to a position of leadership in a church perhaps much like ours, but no inward reality. In fact, there's a whole church, Church of Sardis in Revelation, where Jesus says, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. That's Jesus speaking with authority to a church. People think you're alive. There's a reputation outside, they think you're alive. Maybe there's lots of great hymns going here, and you know, people are clapping, and there's lots of, uh, lots of appearances of life, but actually, no, I know you are dead, he says. Wake up! That's what he says to the church of Sardis. Then there are individuals, like, for instance, the, uh, the man who appeared at the wedding banquet. The king uh, <coughs> organized a banquet, uh, for his uh, marriage banquet, invited people from all over to come. Uh, some, of course, refused, but when he arrived at the banquet, there was a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. Remember him? Friend, what are you doing here? Uh, without your wedding clothes. The man was speechless. He thought he was in the right place, but the, the, the king is saying, no, you don't belong here. Tie him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, says Jesus, in that parable, or the king says in the parable. Or the, the ten virgins, five of course were admitted into the kingdom, but five banged on the door, knocked, let us in. I don't know you, he says. They were expecting to go in, weren't they? They were preparing for it. Perhaps like this man here, all their life they've been getting ready. And then found right at the last that they weren't admitted. But this is Jesus telling this parable. It's not out of my imagination, is it? He speaks these things because he wants people to be warned that this is a reality that many people will confront. I mean, this fellow that uh, I read the letter from, uh, he's different in the one sense, isn't he, that he has not passed over that threshold into death yet. There is hope for him still, isn't there? Um, the editor of the Evangelicals now wrote, uh, he was so moved by what he read there, that he wrote something in that uh, paper, and I've written a letter that was also published as well about the same matter, which uh, you can look at tonight if you want to. But it, 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 it's so crucial, isn't it? This man, before he gets to the state of those virgins who knock on the door, or the wedding guest who's there with the wrong clothes and has to be removed from that place, this person still has a chance. The Bible warns us time and again about deception and especially about self-deception. That most cruel of all deceptions when we actually kid ourselves that we are okay spiritually while we're heading on that broad road to destruction. What a terrible deception that is if we believe that. So my purpose this morning, therefore, is to help all of us, I hope, see more clearly whether we have Christian assurance. That is a genuine confidence, not based on our own 
convictions or our own uh, summing up enough faith to believe, but whether we have assurance, that is the confidence that God gives us because he has done something. He has given us a naturalization certificate to say you are a citizen of heaven and nothing can move you from that because I have done it. And I hold the keys of death and hell, says Jesus, doesn't he? He can say that. I can hold you fast. And if we haven't that, then of course to do something about it now, we thought like this fellow here, before it is too late. God, I am sure, does not want us to be uncertain. When Mark and I and Gurdjieff and others, when we go and visit people on the doors, and uh, often they're quite friendly, we don't meet many hostile responses. Mark's a very friendly guy, and you know, he smiles a lot, and you can't really uh, uh, react to him in any other than a positive way. Uh, but he often uh, finishes by saying to someone who says, well, actually, I, I, I've been to church when I was young, I, I, I heard all, I've been baptized, or whatever, and I, I think I'll take my chances, I think I'm going to be okay, I've got more good in my life than bad, and those sort of things. And Mark says to them, as I've said to you before, well, can I just ask you one question? He says, are you sure you're going to be in heaven? Or are you sure you're going not to be in heaven? Because one or two people have that conviction as well. Um, or are you just someone in, like, in the middle who thinks, well, I'm hoping for the best. And 99% of them say, well, I'm hoping for the best. I, 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 I trust, I, I don't know for certain. And they say like this, no one can be certain, can they? You know, you, you can't know anyway. No one can know what's beyond the grave. Say, well, yes, you can. Jesus Christ died and rose again so that we can know that he's gone beyond the grave. And we know also that when he promised, he said he would send his Holy Spirit uh, into us. That we might also know that we can be with him where he is. But people often say, well that's very arrogant. How can you, how can you say that? How can you be so sure in that way? And that they prefer to be agnostic. Not be agnostic about whether they believe in God or not. But agnostic about whether it's possible to know that you can be in heaven. Or not. But it's not, it's not our conviction, it's not our faith, it's not our th thinking that's brought that about. The book of Hebrews says very clearly, faith, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So the Holy Spirit who co-wrote the book of Hebrews with the writer says actually faith is being certain, faith is being sure. What you can't see now, yes, but it, you, you can know it in other ways. You can be certain of what you do not see. Faith is not about guesswork. It's not about hoping for the best. It's not about a random process that some get picked at the end and some don't. And you just have to sort of take your place in the lottery of life. And you think about it. Why would God, if he is God, leave any of us guessing about the most important thing in life? What sort of God would do that? Eternal destiny at stake, and God says, well, you know, you may make it, you may not. You know, I'll keep you praying, keep on your knees, will it, for a while, hoping, but I don't, you don't know how it's going to turn out in the end, do you? That would be quite, almost sadistic, wouldn't it? If we had that state of anxiety all our lives. We were all born, according to Scripture, and if we become Christians, you know, in our experiences, well, we were all born on a conveyor belt. And that conveyor belt, from the moment we are born and David says, the moment we are conceived, is heading in one direction only. It's the broad road that leads to destruction. God says he will come down and pluck us out of that, lift us up from that broad road, that conveyor belt going to destruction, and place us on a new road, a narrow road that goes to life. And when that happens, we know we have been bought, we have been redeemed, we have been lifted up. Paul says in Ephesians, it's like we were dead in our transgressions, we were dead on that road. And they were lifted up and God made us alive. He breathed his life into us so that we could know new life. That isn't a distinction that you can uh, fail to recognise. That's happened to you. If you were dead, you were brought back to life. You have a life now you never had before and you will know that in so many different ways. Paul says in Romans, we know that our, our old self, our old self, the old citizenship, like, like uh, Mark's American citizenship, we know our old self was crucified with Christ. I no longer live, or he, uh, I live in him. He lives in me. In the Old Testament, we can use that as an example, God didn't leave anyone in Israel uncertain if they were included in that covenant. Of course, you know that the Jews received the mark of circumcision, uh, a visible mark on, on their bodies. It was evidence that they belonged to the people who had been rescued 
from Egypt. They may have been the children or the grandchildren, but they were still of that same family. You could join it from outside like Ruth and Rahab did. But you knew, because of this mark in the flesh, that you were part of that people of God. The special object of God's blessing here on earth. So why in the New Testament should we expect anything less when we come to faith? So, uh, something which is clearly uh, uh, a mark in us, which is clearly understood and recognised as uh, something which is God's imprimatur. God saying, you now belong to me, to my special people. We read in Hebrews chapter 8, if you want to turn to chapter 8 of Hebrews, we'll keep it open, it'll be helpful. We'll come to look at these verses in a minute that uh, Andrew read to us. But we know from verse 7 that there was a problem with that old covenant. They may have the mark of it in their flesh. There could be nothing wrong with it. That first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people. Nothing wrong with the covenant, uh, but the people could not live in that covenant. They were not able. God found fault with them because it required of them to live according to the law. And by faith, and they couldn't do that. So God said he's going to bring about a new covenant. This is what he read, what Andrew read to us earlier. Christ came, of course, as the author of that new covenant. With him, says God, I am well pleased. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. There's no flaw in him, no blemish in him. That's why I'm pleased with him. Those words spoken at his baptism, but also again at the transfiguration, you might remember. We're told earlier in this book of Hebrews that the author of our salvation was made perfect. He was like a piece of wood that is seasoned uh, and made ready for what it's going to have to do in the future when it's part of a, a building. The author of our salvation was made perfect through suffering. It's not that he was imperfect at the beginning, but he needed to learn through the suffering of this world what it was to carry the sins of this world. To be made ready for the cross. He wasn't crucified as a baby, was he? He was crucified as a fully mature adult. Uh, who was fully aware of what suffering was and of what he was doing when he went to the cross. That's what we heard about last week and about penal substitution, what he was doing on that cross. But the resurrection, uh, for which we have such good evidence historically, was confirmation from God, if you like, that our sin had been paid for. The cross has worked. It has done its job of paying for our sin. As Christ rose from the grave, God is saying, yes, you have broken that curse, because you have gone to death, but you have died as a perfect sacrifice. The curse is now lifted. Death is destroyed, and he was raised as the first fruits of the new, uh, of the new kingdom. In Hebrews chapter 9, we went on to that in verse 24. It says, he entered heaven itself, now to appear in God's presence on our behalf. So he ascended into heaven. He went through that curtain, as it were, that barrier that keeps us out. He went through it because he could. But he went through there, it says in verse 24 of chapter 9, on our behalf. He is my representative in heaven. He's yours too if you have come to faith. Last week, Steve spoke about our federal head. Remember our, the federal head last week? That means that actually if we are in Christ, he is the head of all of us who name him as our saviour. He is the second Adam. The first citizenship we received was the citizenship of this world. We are of the generation of Adam and Eve. But Christ is the second Adam who inaugurates a new race, a new generation, a new citizenship. By one offering, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. That is, I'm not perfect in many ways, but if I'm in Christ and he is perfect, his perfection is counted for me. And God looks at me and sees me through like the lens of Christ and says, you'll do. Because my son's death has actually paid for your sins. And I look at you now through those rose tinted glasses of Christ. We, uh, we, we sang at the beginning about uh, Jesus is our king. We have this hope as, a, as an anchor for uh, the soul. Firm and secure. That is the anchor of our faith. That Christ is in the heavens as an anchor. And he can pull us up to that place as well, because that anchor will never move from where it is. The question is, are we, are you and I, in Christ? <clears throat> are we of those who are going to be included 
when that final day and the reckoning comes. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's think about that and let's turn to this chapter of Hebrews. <coughs> the mark of the new covenant is indelible. That's what we're being told here, I think, in, Roman, in <coughs> Hebrews 8, and in verses 8 uh, to 12 that we had read to us on page 1206 of the Church Bibles. Actually, it's still circumcision. It was circumcision in the Old Testament, <clears throat> and it's circumcision in the New Testament. But it has changed. If you're a Christian here this morning, you have been circumcised, but not like the Jews in the Old Testament. Paul says in Romans, you are not a genuine believer if you are only one outwardly. Well, you know the depth what we heard earlier from that man, <clears throat> Mr. Anonymous. Outwardly he was okay, but he knew that inwardly it wasn't right. Nor is circumcision merely outward and physical, says Paul. Real belief is inward circumcision. And it's circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written codes. So yes, we are circumcised. But it's a circumcision not done outwardly, but inwardly. It's the heart, it's our whole, it's like the core of our being that God has put a mark on us. And we will know if that mark is there or not. The Bible tells us. Here, look at uh, uh, Hebrews 8 here, and verse 8. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers. Not in that sense, it's not in the flesh anymore. When I took them by the hands and led them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds. So God's Spirit writes his law on our minds. In the Old Testament, of course, the law was written on tablets of stone, external, carved there, etched there, uh, for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years. Um, but we have a different etching if we are Christians. God's Spirit writes His law not on stone, but on tablets of human flesh. So when we read that word or that phrase, uh, on their minds, in the Scripture, minds refers to our understanding. What happens when we become Christians is that we are given a new understanding of the Bible. Now perhaps like me, some of you I know from what I've, you told me, when you first read the Bible, it was a bit of a mystery to you. It was confusing. At times it seemed to be even contradictory. Uh, and some of you just didn't go into it because it was so turgid and, and so heavy. Some of it perhaps made a little bit of sense, but most of it didn't. But when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit begins to, if you like, arrange your mind to understand what the Bible is saying. I know you've probably heard Gary's testimony about this and others as well, who've, who, who've come to faith and have suddenly found that it, it makes sense. It's the Holy Spirit working in our minds to give us that new mind to be able to see his word the way the Holy Spirit sees it, the way he wrote it, the way he intended it to be understood. The Bible uh, is no longer a confusing volume. But secondly, he also writes it on our hearts. Look at that next line. I'll put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. Verse 10. That is, he gives us a new desire, a new will. To read the Bible, you know, when we're dead in our transgressions, if you and I are dead now, we've got no need for food, have we? You don't eat if you're dead, do you? You don't need to eat if you're dead. But when you're made alive spiritually, you need to eat. You need to stay alive. And the Bible is our daily bread. It is food. I never had a great hunger to read the Word of God. I did read it occasionally, but I never had a great hunger for it before I became a Christian. But the Holy Spirit, when I became a Christian, drew me to want to read his word every day. In fact, if possible, first thing every day. When I was uh, in a professional job, that didn't always happen. But I longed for a moment in the day when I could stop and read the word, or get home in the evening and read it, to make sure that I was not without my daily food. Is that the same for you? Has the Bible become food for life for you, that you cannot do without it? Thirdly, well, going through that next uh, rest of verse 10. <clears throat> I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbour or a man his brother, saying, 
know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. When we become Christians, we have a new relationship. We are brought to know God personally. It's not someone telling us, uh, for a, like in a lecture in a classroom, this is what the Lord is like. Because you say, actually, yes, that's true, but I now know him personally as well. God the Holy Spirit has taken up his residence inside me. Jesus himself said before he died to his disciples, I will ask the Father and he will send another counsellor, another one like himself, like Jesus, the Spirit of Jesus. And he will uh, <clears throat> be with you forever. So that's what we happens. We, we come to know God because we have a personal relationship with him because his Holy Spirit is living inside us. The apostles, when they began to write the New Testament, took that even further. Uh, Paul said in, in Romans, you receive the Spirit, not just of relationship, you receive the Spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. A Abba is like a familiar name for, for God. It's not just, oh, hello God, it's my Father. You've seen, many of you have seen perhaps the new Railway Children um, film that's come out. And Jenny Agatha is now uh, the other end of the age spectrum, isn't she? But you remember that lovely scene at the end uh, of the original Railway Children when she sees her father uh, the first time for a few years as he appears with the smoke uh, as the train departs on the platform and the smoke clears or steam clears. My daddy! Oh, my daddy! And she throws herself into his arms. That's the sort of cry that happens with a Christian. When we become Christians and the Holy Spirit is in us, we cry out, I'm suddenly made a child of God. God is no longer just God or the guy in heaven, whatever, the big bloke upstairs. He is my father, Abba. I can call him because I have now inside a family resemblance. I've been, uh, same way that Mark received a naturalization certificate. I have been naturalized. You have too if you're a Christian. As a citizen of heaven. In the past, and often in the school playground, perhaps you witness this yourself, people often joked about knowing who your father was. Who was your father then? In fact, even Jesus uh, was ridiculed like that, wasn't he? Because people made fun of the fact that Mary, of course, had borne him uh, before she was probably married <coughs> to Joseph. But it's no joking matter, is it, at all? Do you have, who is your father? Do you have a heavenly father? Do you have Abba, father, who has given you uh, new birth. Are you born again? That's what the term means. It's not just an American cliche. Uh, it could be born from above or born of God. Uh, John, in his gospel, speaks about children born not of natural descent, uh, not of human will or of a husband's decision, but born of God. A supernatural birth. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, says John in his letter. And that is what we are. We experience it. Adopting a child is not something that anyone does lightly, is it? Uh, one of the people here of, in this congregation have experienced that uh, from uh, one uh, position or another. We know that when you adopt someone, it is not just uh, a momentary thing, is it? It's a decision you take very, very seriously after much thought and care. You've seen that slogan in the back of cars, uh, a dog is not just for Christmas, but for life. Dog is for life, not just Christmas. Remember that phrase, yeah? When you adopt a human being, it isn't just for life even, it's beyond your life, because when you die, if you adopt a child, that child will inherit whatever possessions you, you leave, leave to them. So actually it goes beyond this, this life when you uh, decide to adopt. And it's the same with God, isn't it? The Holy Spirit is given as God's seal of adoption. The Holy Spirit does come and go, um, as indeed it had happened in the Old Testament. He's indwelling, he's been poured into our lives. In fact, it's the Holy Spirit. He is the one who writes the law on our hearts. So that we can say, we now have an Abba, we now have a Father. It's indelible. It cannot be removed. When God adopts a child, he doesn't remove that adoption. It is forever and ever. And fourthly, in that last line there, uh, verse 12, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. If we've come into a genuine faith, we have been washed inwardly. We've been sanctified, that is made clean. 
We've been justified, put right with God in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul writes that to the Corinthians. He's saying, look, you, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. He's reminding them of their inheritance. As forgiven sinners, we receive a clean conscience. All the past things that we are embarrassed about or that we're guilty of are wiped away. You, if you read Pilgrim's Progress, you'll know that in that uh, book, Pilgrim, when, he, when this man, he's been walking around with a great burden on his back. And when he hears the gospel and believes it, the burden rolls off down the hill and is never seen again. That's what we experience as Christians. We know that our guilt has been taken away. Rolled off our backs. We are free people at last, with free consciences. We can live happily before God. Yes, we do make mistakes and we will come to him and confess sin. When we know immediately we do that, it will be forgiven because we have a promise about that. And we can now live confident on that day when he will come and take us to be with himself. So, what should we conclude from all of this? Well, I hope we've seen that actually the indelible work, the stamp of God, is the work of the Holy Spirit who comes into our lives. And if we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, you will know it. You can be sure of it. Paul compares it to a deposit or a guarantee that we can have. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ, he says. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, a seal of ownership, a certificate that says you belong to me, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Guaranteeing. God doesn't give guarantees like that and then fall short of them, does he? It's God guaranteeing something. If you've ever done a deal with someone, perhaps you've bought a house or bought a car or whatever, um, maybe you bought a car maybe on the second-hand market, and you're thinking, how can I be sure this guy uh, will give me the car? And you say, I'm going to put down a deposit so that the guy knows uh, that I am, uh, I I'm serious about this. Or maybe if you're buying it, you might say to someone, look, I, I know you're going to buy my car, but I want to see the colour of your money. I want to see the colour of your money. Let's put some money down here so I know that you are serious about buying this car off me. It's exactly what God does. The Holy Spirit is the deposit. He's showing us the colour of his money. In fact, what's the colour of his money? The colour of his very nature. Because he gives us not just a, a, a bit of dosh. He gives us the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And Paul says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. We need to understand that. If they're without this experience, it's very important we know that. Like this man here, I spoke about Mr. Anonymous, we spoke about earlier. John, in his uh, letter, says this, We know that we live in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. It's a unanimous uh, conclusion of the New Testament. This is the evidence that you can have. The problem is, we are natural-born deceivers. That's how we are born. We are born in deception. We live in deception. It's all around us today. You watch the leadership debates, you'll hear politicians pouring out words, but you know that they're not all true. They haven't even got the power, even if they wanted them to happen, they, can't, they haven't got the power to enact them. We deceive ourselves in so many ways. In the early church, uh, as things were going well, people liked to join, didn't they, a successful church. Uh, the bandwagon was growing. Ananias and Sapphira joined the early church. They looked very good from the outside. Uh, they brought money into the church. Peter looked and said, how could you deceive the Holy Spirit? Because they kept back part for themselves. If this is all the money we've got from the sale of our house. You can have it all. But they were deceiving people. But God is not mocked. Peter, with the Holy Spirit uh, um, giving him the power, looked at them and said, how could you deceive the Holy Spirit? You know the story, of course, that both of them dropped dead when they were confronted with their deception. Perhaps you've been brought up in a Christian environment. Perhaps from an early age you learned the vocabulary of, of the Christian faith. You were taught it in your home and maybe in your school if you went to a, a school with some sort of Christian tradition. Nothing wrong with that at all, as long as it goes beyond that, because they teach that in order that at some stage you would make it real in your own life. But we can go on and on, like this Mr. Anonymous, knowing the language, knowing what to do to get elected to high office, knowing even to become a pastor of a church as some of them have done. And indeed they did in the Bible as well. 
We're very smart at mimicry. We're very good copyists, all of us. We can watch people and we can ape what they do. But God is not mocked. It won't get us through the final examination. Paul says, the Lord knows those who are his. And one day, when the secrets of men's and women's hearts will be laid bare before him, he will know everything about us. Nothing can be hidden from us. From him. By us. So what should we do about this this morning? Two things. The Corinthian church was a church that was uh, riddled with all sorts of problems. They had false teachers coming in there. Uh, Paul began to doubt uh, whether some of them actually understood the faith at all. So he says to them, test yourselves. Test yourselves, he says. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realise that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? He put it to them. Look, you need to recognise that if you are a genuine believer, you will pass this test. But please examine yourselves, because if you're not in the faith, says Paul to the Corinthians, you need to know now and do something about it. In the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 19, he went to the uh, church in Ephesus, and he found believers there. Uh, and he said to them, as he talked to them, he realised that something was not right about uh, their faith. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Well, no, they said, we didn't realise that it was the Holy Spirit that had to come into our lives as well. And then he puts them right. But they were honest enough to recognise that, and Paul helped them, and they had the evidence. They were given a, a supernatural event as evidence that they had become Christians. The Holy Spirit sealed them. That letter I read earlier, Mr. Anonymous, do you know, it's in the whole of the letter, there was no mention at all of the Holy Spirit. Not once. He never understood it, never received it, never had any experience of it in his life, even, and who knows, it may not be too late by now, but he was very honest, wasn't he, to say that, what he did. But you can see in his testimony, there's no evidence of the Holy Spirit making him new. So test yourselves, please. And then if you want to speak to someone or pray with someone afterwards, maybe not today, maybe more quietly, more privately, do ring me up, email me, or Gary, or Gurdjit, or Ian, or Ian Randall, or Steve, or someone you trust, and say, can I just talk to you about this and pray with you about it? Come this evening and ask more about it there. Recognise that actually you may feel a bit embarrassed about it, or a bit awkward about it. You may have pride saying, I'm not going to go to anyone and talk about this, it's very private. It is, but your eternal destiny is what we're talking about. Don't put that in jeopardy. Secondly, if you are a believer and you know it, and what I said this morning has simply been echoed in your own heart, you are sealed with the Spirit. Make your calling and election sure, says Peter. Don't leave any room for doubt. People who have doubts about it are often those people who are not living a fully Christian life. So Paul says, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labour for the Lord is not in vain. It will be rewarded. Let the evidence of the Holy Spirit be on display. Not so that you get the glory. If it's the Holy Spirit who's on display, then of course the Holy Spirit points to Christ. People will see in your life, not the evidence of you being a very good person, but they'll see the supernatural evidence of the Holy Spirit working in you in a way that you wouldn't do normally. Maybe it might be working in the garden, giving up your time, working, cleaning the, the, the church, whatever else it may be. But you want to do something because you want to do it for Christ, not for your own benefit or your own glory. It is Christ, it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his purposes. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Make your calling and election sure. Let's be a church where people are so full of the Holy Spirit, it's flowing out all the time. So many acts uh, good, uh, of good works, that we love each other, that we work hard for each other, we support each other, we pray for each other, and we reach out to those who are actually at the moment outside because we know they're facing an eternity. And it, it weighs on our hearts if our family and friends are in that situation. And we long for them to come to faith as well.